Welcome to part 17 of the Conspirators. Look at these two pictures. In the photo on the right, we see what we have been trained to see. A more sad sack looking simp would be hard to imagine, right? But Davy Harold's short life prior to the conspiracy belies his reputation. A grade school classmate remembered years later that, quote, when a big boy imposed on David, he would escape with a funny remark, which was called witty, which generally got a laugh, and David was called popular, unquote. Harold came from a good family and had earned a degree in pharmacology before being captivated by Booth. He had a passion for hunting. He claimed he spent two months each fall shooting partridges in southern Maryland becoming very familiar with the terrain and making numerous acquaintances. Indeed, I know nearly everyone in Maryland, he told interrogators after his capture. How then did he become infamously insipid? For one thing, in order to put up some kind of a defense in a hopeless case, Harold's attorney at the conspiracy trial depicted Davy as, quote, a weak, cowardly, foolish, miserable boy, unquote, fond of jokes and eager to please. Once, the well-turned-out youth in the studio photo on the left, his appearance had deteriorated to the point that journalist Jane G. Swisshelm wrote after seeing him in the courtroom, I think I could not have passed Harold on the street without mentally exclaiming, ape. Additionally, the remarks that witnesses recall him making while on the run after the assassination could either be seen as dull-witted silliness or as calculated misdirection. I think it's fair to say that he was in over his head, and his interactions were probably colored by the immense stress that he labored under. The government's charge and specifications, as they specifically addressed Harold, were written as follows. And in further prosecution of said unlawful, murderous, and traitorous conspiracy, and in pursuance thereof, and with the intent as aforesaid, the said David E. Harold did on the night of the 14th of April, A.D. 1865, within the military department and military lines aforesaid, aid and abet and assist the said John Wilkes Booth in the killing and murder of said Abraham Lincoln, and did then and there aid and abet and assist him the said John Wilkes Booth in attempting to escape through the military lines aforesaid and assist the said John Wilkes Booth in attempting to conceal himself and escape from justice after killing and murdering the said Abraham Lincoln as aforesaid. I quote this at length because it's kind of campy and in order to demonstrate the government's justification for holding a military tribunal instead of a civilian trial. Washington was far from any remaining threat of combat at the time of the assassination, but the military department with military lines still existed, as witnessed by the diligence of Sergeant Silas T. Cobb and his crack guard detail at the Navy Yard Bridge. See episode 8, especially if you don't know that I mean this ironically. Had it not maintained this fiction, the government would be hard-pressed to answer the accusation that it had put the trial in the hands of a military commission in order to railroad the defendants into guilty verdicts without recourse to those wheels of justice that grind slow but fine. As the trial proceeded, Harold asked that he may write a confession and was allowed to do so in the courtroom while the trial was not in session. Unfortunately, his confession was not allowed as evidence and has long since gone missing. In the statement he gave authorities under interrogation after his capture, he denied involvement in the assassination and claimed that he just happened to run into Booth in Maryland later that night. Did his later confession hew closer to the truth? Did it implicate or vindicate anyone else? How tantalizing. As Harold and the others edged closer to their extinction, 
their brutal treatment was ameliorated in large part due to the humanity of their prison's commandant, General John Hartranft. The general was successful in getting the canvas hoods permanently removed, except for Lewis Powell's. He got permission to let the prisoners walk in the yard, and he allowed them to receive visitors. Harold had seven sisters, two of whom visited him several times. They took him food on at least one occasion, and on June 26, six of the seven visited. Like Atzerodt, Harold didn't raise his hand against any of the targets, but he did take part in the conspiracy. He also accompanied Powell to the Seward House, though he skedaddled before he completed his assignment of guiding his out-of-towner companion to safety after the attack there. And he committed the deplorable crime of aiding in Booth's attempted escape. At least six of the nine commissioners found him guilty of the assassination charge, which in effect sentenced him to hang. On to Samuel Mudd. Attempts to clear the name of Dr. Samuel Mudd spanned a century and more. The tireless efforts of his grandson led to sympathetic responses from Presidents Carter and Reagan and a 1982 bill in Congress to overturn his conviction. But the bill died in committee. Dr. Mudd had better success in Hollywood. A 1937 movie directed by the legendary John Ford, The Prisoner of Shark Island, absolves him of any truck with J. Wilkes Booth. Odd as it may sound, many people are more influenced by movies that they watch than they are by history books that they don't read. Thus, a belief in his innocence persists to this day. Mudd would deny any prior knowledge of Booth long after he could credibly support that story, and this was his downfall. Like Mudd, John Lloyd from Surratt's Tavern was arrested soon after the assassination and protested ignorance and innocence. But Lloyd broke after a few days of interrogation and cooperated fully with the authorities. As a witness against the conspirators, he could not, under the laws then in force, be charged in the conspiracy, as we discussed in episode 11. This sounds crazy today, but it's key to understanding the difference between Mudd and Lloyd. In contrast to Lloyd, Mudd persisted in his denials. He kept saying that the first time he ever saw Booth was at 4 a.m. on April 15th, despite it coming to light that he had met Booth in November or December. So, unlike Lloyd, who was set at liberty, Mudd was charged with the conspiracy, tried, convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. Still, Mudd would likely have fared better if he had been up front earlier on with the authorities. Let's do a timeline and see if we can determine what went wrong with an allegedly innocent Samuel Mudd. November or December, 1864. Booth is introduced to Mudd by the son-in-law of Dr. William Queen, whom Booth was visiting in Southern Maryland, see parts two and nine. Booth is planning the kidnapping of Lincoln under the guise of looking to buy land and horses, but we don't know for sure what he said to Mudd at the time. December 19th, Booth makes a surprise visit to Mudd's farm and ends up staying the night. Admittedly, this type of hospitality was not unusual in that place and time. December 20th, Mudd accompanies Booth into nearby Bryantown, where Booth looks to buy a saddle and bridle for a horse he purchased that morning from Mudd's neighbor. They stop in a tavern where they meet Thomas Harbin. Mudd introduces Booth to Harbin a rabid pro-Southerner. Taking Harbin aside in an upstairs room, Booth convinces him to be a guide in the kidnapping plot. Was Mudd totally ignorant of this exchange? We don't know. December 23rd, Mudd goes Christmas shopping in Washington. He is hailed on the street by Booth, who asks him for an introduction to John Surratt. Walking toward Surratt's house, Booth and Mudd chance to meet Surratt and Lewis Weichmann on the street. Booth takes Mudd, Surratt, and Weichmann to his hotel room for a drink. Did Booth talk to Mudd about the kidnapping plot? We don't know. Saturday, April 15, 1865. Booth and David Harold ride to Mudd's house after the assassination and wake him at 4 a.m., asking him to tend to Booth's broken fibula. 
Mudd does so in an upstairs room where Booth sleeps for several hours. When he awakes, he asks for a razor and removes his mustache. Later that day, Mudd goes into Bryantown, where he first learns that Lincoln has been shot by Booth. Booth and Harold are leaving about the same time Mudd returns home, and Mudd complains that they have deceived him. Tuesday, April 18th. Federals visit Mudd at his house. Initially hesitant, he tells about the visit of the strangers and says that he didn't recognize them. He said he first heard about the assassination at church on Sunday rather than Saturday. Friday, April 21st. Federals return to Mudd's house. He again says he didn't recognize the 4 a.m. visitors. When the Federals say they are going to search the house, Mudd and his wife suddenly remember that the boot that Mudd cut off the injured man's leg is still upstairs. Mrs. Mudd retrieves the boot. Lieutenant Alexander Lovett turns down the top of the boot and finds written there, J. Wilkes. Mudd says he hadn't noticed that before. Federals ask Mudd if he knew Booth. Mudd said that he had been introduced to him in November or December. Mudd is arrested. While riding to the outpost set up by the Federals in Bryantown, Mudd says that he now believes that the man whose leg he set was Booth. Federals interrogate Mudd at Bryantown, asked if he had seen Booth from the time they were first introduced until the time Booth arrived on April 15th. Mudd said he had not. Sometime in April, Lewis Whiteman is interrogated in Secretary of War Edwin Stanton's office. Asked if he knew Samuel Mudd, he recalls the meeting in Washington on December 23rd, which would mean Mudd lied about not seeing Booth again in December after their initial meeting. Whiteman actually testified mistakenly that the meeting was in January, which was pounced on by Mudd's attorney. Did Mudd recognize Booth when he showed up in the middle of the night? Probably. He allegedly said so privately years later. He would not have known about the assassination at that time unless Booth told him. The best guess is that Booth didn't tell him. However, Mudd did note that Booth was armed with two revolvers, which might have indicated that he was on some kind of desperate errand. When coaxed by the Federals who visited him, he said he did think it was suspicious that the visitor shaved his mustache. When Mudd heard in Bryantown that Booth had assassinated the president less than a day after the shooting, the window opened for him to tell the authorities that Booth had been at his house and more plausibly claim his innocence. He hesitated, understandably. His sympathies were with the South, as were those of his neighbors, and if he became the informer that enabled the quick capture of the murderer, he would likely have become a pariah. Also, his previous connections to Booth would cast suspicion on him with the Federals, perhaps unfairly. There is clearly a possibility that Mudd was involved in the conspiracy, at least the kidnapping conspiracy, up to his teeth and forehead. But for now, we are giving him the benefit of the doubt. That window of opportunity closed quickly, and any subsequent confessions, especially after Sunday the 16th when the assassination was discussed where he went to church, would have to explain the steadily growing time gap between discovering the truth about Booth's visit and sharing it with the authorities. Thus, when questioned about the visitors, he successively denied he had visitors, then admitted he had visitors but denied recognizing Booth, then admitted he recognized Booth but denied seeing him between December 20th and April 15th. Mudd's lack of candor hurt him severely at the trial. He would have been damaged even more had the commission heard the confession that George Atcherot proffered while in prison. His oral statement, given on May 1st, was transcribed and included the following. Dr. Mudd knew all about it, as Booth sent, as he told me, liquors and provisions for the trip with the president to Richmond about two weeks before the murder to Dr. Mudd's. If true, this would have been consistent with Booth sending weapons and binoculars to Saratsville. However, when the prosecution brought up the matter, Atzerodt's attorney objected, saying the confession was obtained under duress, 
since Atzerodt gave it while restrained in irons in a prison cell. The court overruled the objection, but the prosecution inexplicably did not return to that line of questioning. Atzerodt's confession then disappeared and did not resurface until 1977. Was Atzerodt spinning lies in an attempt to save himself? Maybe, but on the other hand, it was an oddly specific accusation made before the trial started about a defendant that there is no record of Atzerodt meeting. True or not, his statement, if allowed, might have well convinced one more commissioner to vote for conviction, in which case Samuel Mudd would have swung with the others who received six or more guilty findings. Instead, he joined the contingent that voyaged to the dry Tortugas. So, we can't say for sure if Mudd was guilty of conspiring with Booth in their multiple visits. All we can say for sure is that he repeatedly lied about those visits. Once at Fort Jefferson, Mudd soon failed in an attempted escape, which resulted in his hard labor being made that much harder. Then, in 1867, the Fort Jefferson prison suffered a yellow fever outbreak. The prison physician quickly succumbed and Mudd was asked to take charge of the medical response. He did so in such an exemplary fashion that the soldiers at the fort, who suffered a higher fatality rate than the prisoners, expressed their gratitude to him in a petition they sent to President Johnson. Johnson pardoned Mudd in February of 1869, shortly before leaving office. Mudd's act of historic selflessness may or may not have influenced the pardon, the others were set free as well. But it surely was the difference between oblivion and a sympathetic biopic. Next time on Part 18, Michael O'Loughlin and Lewis Powell. See you then.